Hello, everybody. Uh, today, I would like uh, to share our experience uh, how to use uh, machine learning algorithm in uh, practice uh, of integration in uh, Kubernetes and uh, uh, which uh, algorithm we apply it uh, in our experience. Uh, first of all, of all, I'd like uh, to introduce uh, ourselves. My name is Igor Gustamiasov, and uh, I'm head of integration uh, the department in Sberbank uh, Technology. And I also would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Maxim Chernovsky, who is uh, Chief Software Development Manager and uh, uh, who We'll provide some uh, technical insight uh, for you about main topic of presentation today. So let's start. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, I'd like uh, to say uh, several words about uh, our organization. Uh, we are big uh, financial and uh, ecosystem organization, and uh, main our focus is. Uh, uh, best uh, client experience and uh, technological leadership. Uh, our company takes uh, first uh, places in uh, financial services. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, retail clients and corporate clients. Uh, we uh, have significant market share in Russia. And uh, also last year, uh, we did uh, a great step uh, in the direction of development uh, non-financial non services and um, in development of our ecosystem. At the same time, uh, uh, last year, we introduced a new IT platform uh, with focus of uh, reliability, zero downtime and uh, applying uh, machine learning algorithms uh, in uh, all, across all services of uh, our platform. Um, why we um, did it and do it, uh, you know, because uh, uh, we um, did uh, a lot of work uh, in, uh, in the direction of uh, migration, uh, our legacy system uh, to uh, cloud uh, ecosystem uh, and uh, uh, consequently it uh, um, provides uh, in uh, it, it provides a, a lot of uh, a huge amount of uh, application uh, telemetry uh, uh, which uh, should be collected and uh, uh, transport processing uh, in appropriate way. Uh, so, of course, uh, we have uh, some monitoring issues uh, because uh, our IT systems landscape is rather large and complex and uh, uh, we have uh, common problems like uh, uh, alerts and metrics hell, uh, unclear uh, topology, unclear uh, integration. Uh, <clears throat> unclear integration. Uh, interactions, uh, dependencies, uh, which uh, we understand in real time. And uh, also uh, we uh, have some uh, issues uh, connected uh, to elasticity about uh, inefficient, uh, uh, <clears throat> inefficient manipulation, inefficient uh, uh, rising uh, of uh, enough uh, resources uh, for our workloads, uh, after scaling issues, uh, application start time issues, and so on. And of course, uh, for us, uh, the main focus uh, uh, is, uh, in, uh, is on uh, uh, real-time interactions, so overall latency, uh, through uh, complex topology also uh, is uh, the problem uh, for us. So uh, if uh, we look at uh, it as um, high-level concepts, uh, 
I can say that uh, we work uh, with two types of telemetry. The basic one, uh, which we built uh, from uh, the Kubernetes tires. Uh, and in this level, uh, we are most interested in performance of uh, containers, uh, alerts, uh, which we can uh, collect uh, from uh, containers uh, and uh, then processing in our models. And uh, the second level of data telemetry, uh, which we collect uh, through the service mesh, uh, we um, use this information uh, to, uh, to create a graph uh, for individual workloads uh, to understand uh, all parameters of uh, network interaction, uh, duration, latency, amount of data transferred, errors, and so on. Uh, at the first stage, uh, all our monitoring data is collected in intermediate storage of metrics. Uh, when uh, this information uh, is aggregated and uh, uh, put uh, to long-term storage, uh, long-term storage we uh, use uh, to prepare a, a data set from for our training machine learning models, and then uh, use it uh, for Mm, developing uh, our model and uh, processing this data to, uh, 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 to, to, to engine of uh, our machine learning cooperation system. So the system uh, we can uh, divide uh, to uh, uh, two main parts. Uh, the first part uh, is the preparation and evaluation of models. Uh, and uh, the second part is a real-time execution of trained models. Uh, for uh, uh, speaking of technologies, uh, we use uh, Istio as a service mesh uh, to collect uh, service mesh metrics and uh, uh, Prometheus uh, as a data layer and uh, to collect our data. But uh, I'd like to know that. Uh, Technologically, we can uh, use uh, any other uh, uh, service mesh implementation and any other database uh, uh, for time series uh, to collect data from for the model. Great. Thank you, Igor, for the awesome intro and uh, high level explanation of the system. So, uh, we have uh, figured out uh, the conceptual approach and technologies. Let's talk about specific tasks. Uh, we have our own private cloud at Sber, uh, in which uh, we host many Kubernetes clusters. And in general, we can say that each of these clusters is uh, something like uh, an on-premise uh, hosted cluster. And each of these clusters uh, can have several hundreds of nodes. For launching ports, we use a standard scheduler. Workloads are completely independent in terms of deployment and uh, can belong to different teams. So here is an assumption. We can reduce network resource consumption as well as optimize overall latency by combining workloads in the thing uh, that, which is known as schedule group. So uh, let's see how it can be done. Uh, as I said, uh, we use Istio as a service mesh. Uh, so uh, I will describe all methods uh, using the example of the well-known book info application. I am sure many of you are familiar with it. So just very briefly, this is a simple application. In total, we have uh, six interactive services. And of course, uh, the Istio service mesh, uh, service mesh is used, uh, is used uh, to collect uh, metrics and telemetry of the services. Uh, 
Uh, using the Istio request total metric, we built a uh, directed uh, call graph for our applications. Uh, the vertices of this uh, graph are the interacting services. Uh, I use uh, service names S1, uh, S6 for simplicity. The services correspond to the services of the booking for application. The edges of the graph are, are the facts of network interactions. And uh, this is also quite simple. You can notice that uh, the graph is weighted, and yes, you are right. Uh, as an example, I added uh, the average latency of request processing as a weight. Uh, the values are taken from each your request duration metric, respectively. This metric is chosen because in the example, I want to group applications and minimize network latency. However, in general, any metric from your service mesh uh, can be used as a weight of these edges. As a result, uh, we get we got a simple data array which is shown which is uh, shown on the slide. The rows in the table correspond uh, to the edges of our graph, and uh, the columns correspond to vertices and weights. Uh, if we sort uh, this uh, data set in uh, descending order of edge uh, weights, we can group our our vertices in uh, one cycle. So the first pair of services, uh, the delay is maximum respectively. The first group is created and the two services uh, are added to it. Next, uh, the second pair of services, uh, since S5 is already in group one, then S3 is added to it. Next, uh, S1 and S6 create a new group since no related services have been found yet. And here, uh, there is an important point. The size of the groups acts uh, as a parameter of this method. And uh, this allows us to split the connectivity of services and not combine the uh, entire chain into one group. Uh, in this case, uh, the size is uh, three. And uh, uh, when we process in edges of four and five, uh, nothing happens. Uh, the services are already allocated. And since uh, the limit for group one uh, has been reached, uh, the second and the first groups will not merge. At the end of the method service uh, S2 assigns to the second group. And here the work is done. And let's see what we got here. We have two groups of booking for services in our cluster, yellow and green teams. Uh, services product page, uh, revision version one and details were included in group one and services reviews uh, version two and uh, three and ratings fell into the second group. Great, uh, the approach works and uh, let's see what we can do about it. In the simplest case, uh, we can use node selectors to place a group of applications uh, in a specific zone of the cluster, which provides the most uh, comfortable conditions uh, for the grouping uh, criterion we have chosen. For example, the network between hosts uh, is very fast in this zone. Uh, we can also use uh, service topology uh, to localize traffic within the selected zones. Uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, now uh, this mechanism uh, is deprecated and more correctly to use the topology where hints here. Additionally, uh, we can use pod affinity rules and place replicas of intensively connected applications on the same node to ensure maximum of performance. However, uh, we have to be careful here uh, because uh, uh, this affinity can lead to performance can lead to performance issues in large clusters, and uh, uh, we should not forget about fault tolerance and other stuff for HA and DR processes. Finally, you can use uh, this grouping mechanism uh, for the uh, I would say smart pod topology spread constraints. As for us, it's bare uh, in our clusters. Uh, there are a large number of independent applications that can interact between this uh, between each other. Uh, we use collocation in a recommendation mode. Uh, it uh, automatically investigates the relationships between workloads and clusters, uh, and then manually. Uh, and then we use manually uh, this information uh, to mark up the cluster infra and configure the cluster scheduler. 
Uh, okay, that's all about workloads collocation. Let's talk about anomaly detection. Uh, we have a large set of metrics here, and this metrics can be analyzed to find anomalies uh, in them. And uh, here is an assumption. We can recognize abnormal values of a system and determine the root cause of these anomalies through the correlation of network and system metrics. Uh, let's uh, see how it can be done. Uh, here, uh, I will tell you about uh, booking for application again because we use Istio, but uh, there is one addition. Uh, there is one more rating service, uh, and uh, I added uh, it here to build uh, a more complex example. Uh, let's assume uh, an anomaly as a point uh, that uh, is uh, sufficiently distant from the main uh, density of points so uh, that the probability of this event can be considered uh, very small. In this case, uh, the problem of detecting anomalies can be reduced to training the model on historical data, predicting the next value of the time series and classifying uh, the point as anomalous, depending on whether the real uh, value of the time series data, uh, uh, sorry, uh, depending on a real value uh, of time series data and uh, when it fits into the predicted confidence interval. Here we can uh, see on different models, uh, for example, uh, it is uh, Gaussian process, ERIMA, moving average and so on. Uh, we use a model based on clustering uh, mechanism using DB scan, and uh, this model uh, shows uh, a good result, uh, but it turns out to be sensitive to data normalization, and uh, uh, you have to keep it in mind. Uh, the, results, uh, the results of the models in uh, terms of average time uh, is presented in, in the table on this slide. Uh, okay, uh, now we know how to automatically find anomalies in metrics. Let's see what we can do with this information. For Kupkion, uh, for, for the Kupkion con, uh, we checked uh, the micro RC algorithm uh, on the example of our favorite uh, uh, booking fabrication, and let's see uh, what came of it. Anomaly detector notices time de deviation, deviations uh, in requests and uh, a root cause detection method uh, can start with this data. Uh, the first uh, thing we need to do in this approach is to build a directed application graph uh, where the nodes the services and the arrows between them are the corresponding requests from one service to another. We already seen it uh, in the previous task. From the complete graph uh, of the application, uh, a subgraph uh, is located, which contains uh, the abnormal nodes plus adjustments to normal ones. Uh, here, uh, we've got an anomalous subgraph and uh, just let uh, do a few tasks on it. At first, uh, we have to calculate the, the weights of edges as a correlation between uh, response time and average uh, anomalous response time. Next, uh, we have to calculate the anomaly scores, scores of nodes uh, as a product of average node weight and the maximum of uh, correlated utiliz utilization uh, metric. And next, uh, we can use uh, uh, the personal personalized uh, page rank algorithm to determine the uh, probable calls uh, of the anomaly. This method produce, uh, produces a ranked list uh, where, uh, where in the first place uh, in the root cause uh, of the anomalies, uh, we can find uh, the reviews version to service. The most correlated anomalous response time metric is a uh, rate uh, container memory working set bytes, which reflects uh, to the essence uh, of this anomaly uh, heap overflow. Uh, so, uh, we looked uh, at anomaly uh, detection methods and uh, uh, an algorithm for finding, to, to finding our root causes. Uh, how uh, can this information be useful? 
At first, I want to speak about alerting in modern enterprise systems. Uh, there are thousands of alerting rules, and a single problem can cause uh, dozens of notifications. Uh, while detecting anomalies will autom uh, automatically respond to suspicious uh, events in the infrastructure, method, uh, methods of uh, finding uh, root causes can significantly uh, reduce uh, the flow of notifications which is a perfect solution for the system administration. It is important to note uh, that the anomaly detector can be implied uh, to establish uh, monitoring uh, thresholds, uh, I would say, since uh, the threshold values are most often selected individually uh, based on experimental data. Anomaly detection allows you to automate this process. Here we got the third important aspect uh, based on the automatic detection of anomalies. So we can form flexible rules for automatic traffic management. So when we make, when we make changes in our infra, uh, for example, when we perform canary releases and so on. As for us at the BR, we use anomaly and root cause detectors in the process of chaos engineering. Uh, we achieve a deep understanding uh, of various aspects of the systems and uh, then use uh, this information to manually configure our uh, monitoring solutions. Uh, unfo uh, unfortunately, concrete models of root uh, cause analysis uh, in our infrastructure is not open sourced yet, uh, but uh, uh, so I will not cover uh, them in this uh, talk, but uh, maybe in future we will talk about it. And uh, the last but not the least, uh, predictive auto-scaling. Uh, when migrating to Kubernetes, many of our colleagues, especially, uh, especially uh, those uh, who write code in Java, uh, faced uh, the problem of slow start of applications. Uh, given the fact uh, that the ports are mortal and the elasticity of applications in our environment is achieved uh, through automatic uh, scaling, uh, a slow, a slow start of an application uh, became an unpleasant problem that we really had to fight. Mm, the question arose, what if we try to scale the application not re reactively, but proactively, uh, always having the necessary amount of replicas at hand? Uh, an impressive set of metrics here from containers suggest uh, uh, what we can try. The method is designed uh, to predict the re required number of service pods. Two key methods are used uh, to predict the number of pods in a service standard uh, uh, HPA and predictive autoscaler. As an input, uh, the method uses uh, the time series uh, of a specific metric uh, called value, for example, CPU, as well as uh, data on pod resource limits, pod limit, and it, uh, its uh, desired uh, ratio uh, on the resources. The calculation of the number of pods in the HPA uh, is performed uh, in a very simple manner. It is necessary to split the total demand for a resource uh, into the limit of a separate pod, taking into account the ratio. Uh, a limitation uh, is also impo uh, imposed uh, in terms of the minimum uh, and maximum number of uh, pods. Uh, predictive autoscaler calculates uh, the number of pods uh, in the same way, but instead of uh, the last actual value of the, our metric, uh, the predicted value is used. For training and prediction, uh, the time series data is supplemented with uh, some features at the moment, uh, legs for the last 20 minutes uh, and an hour in a day are used as a science, as features, uh, but uh, this list is, no, is non-exhaustive and uh, can be supplemented. On this slide uh, is an example of data transformation and feature generation. Uh, predictive autoscaler uses two models to predict values, uh, cut boost uh, model CBM and the moving average with a window of 20 values. Uh, cut boost model is a gradient boosting model for decision trees. Uh, the model allows you to track uh, the growth of the lot with a small time delay. Uh, all the two values obtained, uh, the maximum is uh, selected. 
Uh, those uh, DCBM model uh, allows you to quickly respond to an increase uh, in the load and uh, moving average in turn partially uh, damp dampens uh, vibrations and does not allow the pulse to be lowered quickly, which is important with uh, a sharply available uh, variable nature of the load. Uh, moving average responds to load growth uh, with a long delay, uh, which makes it impossible to use uh, to use it uh, as the main uh, prediction model. model. However, uh, the response uh, to load uh, reduction is also low, slow, uh, which is very good and uh, which is uh, which will be used later. Uh, the ECBN model can predict uh, the value of a quantity with small delay, which is an advantage when detecting increasing load. In this case, uh, the model uh, reacts uh, at the same speed to a decrease, uh, which can adversely affect with the sharply variable uh, nature of the load. Uh, it can be seen from the graph that uh, the model uh, reacted uh, to the decrease at the moment when the load began to grow again. So we combine two models and it allow, uh, allows us to quickly respond to an increase in load and at the same time, slow respond to a decrease, which is very effective for the uh, predictive autoscaler. Uh, I suppose that's all about concrete features uh, of uh, ML ops pipelines uh, in our environment. And uh, uh, now we can talk about our future plans. Igor, it's your turn. Unfortunately, we don't hear you. You are on mute. No. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you for your brilliant speech. Uh, and uh, as Maxim said, uh, we use uh, our machine learning uh, cluster now as a in recommendation mode. And of course, uh, after collecting uh, enough uh, amount uh, of statistic, uh, we are going to switch uh, in uh, operation mode and. Uh, uh, implement uh, all our features uh, in a real time manner. And uh, the sec in the second, uh, we would like in uh, future uh, switch from uh, evaluation of efficiency of uh, our models uh, by experts uh, to, uh, to developing some type of uh, a feedback channel uh, from uh, model runtime uh, to improve efficiency of uh, our models and uh, uh, improve uh, speeds uh, in which we can uh, train uh, our model uh, in production zone. So, and uh, in the third point uh, that's directly related uh, to the second, uh, in that addition to continuous uh, assessing our models would like uh, uh, to create a continuous uh, delivery pipeline for our models uh, to uh, deliver new feature uh, in, in quick manner and uh, receive uh, uh, actual training set uh, uh, actual statistic from runtime to our developers uh, and uh, creates uh, uh, this uh, model life cycle in more efficient way. I suppose that's all for today. Uh, thank you for um, your attendance. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, in the future, we provide some additional information uh, about uh, how we can uh, uh, how we developed uh, uh, our machine learning cluster management. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you all for joining. Uh, and now we are ready for your questions. Thank you.